now. On 105.9 FM and streaming worldwide on the WMAL app. O'Connor and Company. It is 7.06 in your nation's capital, and, well, we can't stop this steaming locomotive. It's heading downhill. Even if we turn the engine off, our momentum would plow us straight through any barrier. There's no stopping O'Connor and company today. In 30 minutes, Dan Epstein of America First Legal will join us. He's representing that lawyer who used to represent Cassidy Hutchinson, got fired apparently at Liz Cheney's request, and then suddenly Cassidy Hutchinson changed her testimony in front of the January 6th committee. That, that doesn't sound kosher. I'm no legal expert, Julie Gunlock, but that doesn't quite sound kosher to me. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Look forward to we'll that ask conversation. the counselor about that coming up in 30 minutes. Also, Julie, by the way, speaking of legal experts, well, we, we have one at our disposal here. <laughs> Coley Stimson, he's the senior legal fellow at Heritage Foundation, and his book is so important and sort of told the story about not just the crime problem in this country, but uh, one of the exacerbating features of the ongoing crime problem, and that is prosecutors refusing to prosecute. The book is called Rogue Prosecutors, and Cully joins us now. Good morning, Cully. Good to talk with you, sir. Morning, guys. Thanks for having me. Uh, You know, first of all, I'd love for you to touch on this uh, growing scandal that does not get enough information, that the FBI's crime statistics now were just sort of um, modified. Uh, The great John Lott uh, sort of found this and saw that the FBI, you know, quietly, stealthily changed their crime statistics. Of course, as you were saying, and many people were saying, Crime is up. It's just that many jurisdictions are not interfacing with the FBI crime database. And uh, suddenly we went from 2022 being uh, crime down 2.1 percent to crime up 4.5 percent. That's a a major change. And it sort of uh, plays into the politicization of of prosecutors and the politicization of law enforcement that we've seen growing that you document in your book. Right. And it's not surprising um, that they finally came around to acknowledging the reality of what's happening on the streets, because you feel when you go to the big cities, uh, when your head's on a swivel, that crime is on the rise, that there's something wrong. Uh, But the reason we've been saying all along that crime is on the rise, because we look at the police department own websites in Chicago, in Philadelphia, in New York, in L.A., in San Francisco. And of course, they want to get funded every year. So they actually post the real numbers on their website. Uh, on a daily basis yeah. of all the Category 1 crimes. And so we right. knew what was going on, and that's why we've been talking about it. It's just that when the FBI changed their statistical gathering uh, software a few years ago where they were normally getting about 80 90 percent of cities reporting, now they have a 40 50 60 percent of cities, and they exclude Philly and New York and Chicago and L.A. Right. and the big cities. Right. And so yes. it's like n- nothing to see here, no crime going on here. So what they did to make up the gap is they guesstimated And so when they came out with this 4.5 percent increase and very quietly slid it in, John picked it up, wrote about it, exploded all over the news. But look, the genie's out of the bottle. The Democrats have been using this crime is falling mantra forever, and they're not going to change their mantra. And and by the way, Cully, whether it's Alvin Bragg in Manhattan or whether it's uh, George Gascon in Los Angeles or Steve Descano right here in our backyard, uh, Fairfax County, Uh, Mm -hmm. exacerbating this uh, rising crime are these prosecutors who are hell-bent on not prosecuting criminals and not keeping them uh, behind bars. And that's what your book focuses on, which now has been turned into a documentary from Heritage. It is released today. Here, take a listen to some of the trailer we've got here. Two of the homicidal maniacs responsible for my son's death had their gang assault and murder charges completely dismissed. I later learned that Alvin Bragg often dismisses and reduces uh, dangerous criminals. But unfortunately, this same scenario is playing out in other cities across America, too. Cully Simpson, you're a former prosecutor yourself. It's got to, uh, I'm, I'm so glad that you are shining a light on this and that you're drawing attention to it. But it's just got to boil your blood, no, knowing how much you love the law and, and love the concept of uh, uh, state prosecutors or district attorneys or whatever jurisdiction there may be, that their, their responsibility and their duty in part of the law enforcement apparatus is to put these people behind bars. And you've got people who are deliberately doing the opposite. Yeah, you need an advocate for victims. Victims deserve justice. 
Uh, and so I'm passionate. I was passionate about a, being a prosecutor and a defense lawyer and a judge because I wanted to play the role that the law assigned to me at the time in that job. And when you have these Soros rogue prosecutors, they're not advocating for victims. They're advocating for the defendant. Larry Krasner, when he was elected to Philadelphia as the DA a few years ago on his party, at the party of the night he was elected, he called himself a public defender with power. So that's why people need to watch this video. That's he calls himself, a public defender with power. And so this movie includes Chesa Boudin and Pamela Price in their own words. We have them on tape. We co-hosted panels with them. Madeline Brame, who you played at the top here, who spoke, whose son was murdered. Rafael Manguel, who you know from Manhattan Institute. Heather McDonald, who's just amazing. Oh, yeah. Uh, it features real prosecutors like Tin Ho from Sacramento, who's a Democrat, who talks about the noble role of the prosecutor. So these are the stakeholders in the community, the real victims, mothers in L.A., minority mothers in L.A., whose children were murdered and Gascon wouldn't punish and go after the murderers with the full force of the law. So this is the culmination of years of work, years of videos, years of interviews, all pushed together in a pretty slick 16-minute montage and story of the full story of what's going on. Kali, you know, one thing that really I think is frightening, though, is that the media doesn't cover it and the media allows these lies like the one we saw about crime rates going down. Um, and then there's a correction, a quiet correction, uh, and, and there's no coverage of that. Um, I'm so grateful that your your book and your this d documentary is out to, to shed more light on this. But do you think we will see improvements in media coverage of this issue, I know probably not until the election's over, but going forward, will we will we see an improvement in this? Because again, the media allows these government officials to get away with this, and these prosecutors to get away with this. At the end of the day, Julian, no one really cares what the media says because people in these cities, especially Democrats in blue cities, are voting these people out of office because they're sick of it. Now they vote them into office in the first place, believing the blather and the reimagined focus group, you know, soft, cushy words. But at the end of the day, they're the ones that are suffering and minorities are suffering in droves because of this failed social experiment. That's the reason that Marilyn Mosby lost in Baltimore. That's the reason that Kim Fox isn't running for reelection in Chicago. That's the reason Chesa Boudin got booted uh, in a recall election in San Francisco, where 4% of the registered voters are Republicans. That's the reason I think George Gascon is going to lose in LA in two weeks, because Nathan Hochman, who's a real prosecutor, is running 30 points ahead of him. And yeah. the minorities groups are sick of these people. And so I hope that, you know, whatever lies the media tells or the just not talking about it, it's the silent death, right? If you don't talk about it, it didn't happen. That's their yeah. real tactic here. Yeah. So well, I let's think not forget. that this pendulum is swinging the right way. Let's not forget Buddha Bibberai, right, in our backyard here, oh, too, yeah. which right. was a, a great victory right. last time around. Uh, hey, Kelly, can you stick with us? Because, uh, again, this is a, a major issue in this campaign, and— uh, I, I think that you've, you've just tapped into this, and the fact that this uh, documentary is coming out today is so important so that people can share it on social media. And I've also got some questions about what's going on with the criminal illegal aliens that we've found who are, are still in this country and not deported yes. yet. Can you stay? We just got to do a quick traffic break. Are you good? Happy to. Yep, sure thing. All right, more with Cully Stimson Heritage Foundation. And uh, honestly, I think that it comes back to it in these final two weeks, Julie, that the most important issues will still be the same issues that were most important at the beginning of the campaign. The economy the border, and crime. And uh, two out of those three is covered brilliantly by Cully Stimson at Heritage. It's 7.15 WMAL Traffic and Weather. Traffic and Weather, brought to you by Hadid Carpet Cleaning. We continue with Cully Stimson of Heritage Foundation, who authored the uh, incredibly important book, Rogue Prosecutors, now turned into a documentary that's available today, so you can share it on your social media. Just uh, catch it over there at Heritage. Cully, um, we got to talk about the billionaire elephant in the room, uh, George Soros. George Soros looms large in this entire story. You've referred to him and these prosecutors, of course, as Soros-funded. But I I'd love for you to peel that back a little bit. I you know, reached a point in the media where you're not even allowed to mention this guy's name without you know, organizations calling you names and saying that you're anti-Semitic or something. But this is true. This is real. George Soros has taken his wealth. He's funneled it through uh, political action groups. And they have propped up these prosecutors. But I guess the larger question is, why? Is, is it really just some sympathy for the so-called systemic racism in our judicial system? Or is it more insidious than that? Do, does George Soros and his sort of organizations, do they want to sow chaos 
so that then, you know, in chaos comes desperate people calling for desperate measures like Marxism and other solutions that we've seen in other countries. Well, you're right. When we talk about Soros and when I debate liberals in college and law school campuses, they call me an anti-Semite. And then I, of course, point out that I'm married to a Jew. That argument sort of goes away. We're talking about his policies. We're talking about where he puts his money. So when he puts $1.7 million into a PAC, which elects Larry Krasner, and when he gives seven, dollars $800,000 to Descano, when he gives you know, money to these various people around the country through a PAC, all legal, uh, he does it to elect people. And the, the animating force behind this movement, and this is, this is why this book has resonated, because we quote the left. We quote the activists themselves. We're not telling the story ourselves. We're telling the story through their own words. They believe the entire criminal justice system is racist, and the only way to fix it in their minds is to reverse engineer and dismantle it. That's their word. Those are their words. That's Rachel Barkow, who was on the U.S. Sentencing Commission. And the way you dismantle it is you destroy the adversarial nature of the system. You replace a hard-charging, ethical, fair prosecutor with a pro-criminal, anti-victim, cop-hating zealot, and that's what they do. They think that prisons are modern-day slave plantations. Those are their words, not ours. Angela Davis wrote, our prison's obsolete. This movement is animated by them. So the reason we did our documentary, it's not really about the book, it's to tell the full story, is we outed these people. So they finally had to co-host, and believe it or not, a crime symposium at the Berkeley Law School this spring with none other than Chesa Boudin. And who did he put on some of the panels? Jamalia Morgan, a Northwestern University law professor who has been writing about the need to abolish all prisons. Shaka Rahman, the head of Stop LAPD, who's been calling for and writing about defunding the police. They're not shy about what's animating them. They want to get rid of all prisons. They want to defund the police, and they want to replace prosecutors with public defenders with power. This is who they are. And so there are good DAs who are Democrats. Tin Ho from Sacramento County, who's in this featured show too, who talk about the noble profession of prosecutors. But you don't have civil society, Julie and Larry. You do not have a civil society if you don't enforce the law. Society breaks down and it becomes chaos. Holly, this is related to that. You recently wrote about criminal illegal aliens, uh, and you talk about how the Biden-Harris administration has allowed over 95 percent of illegal aliens who have been convicted of serious crimes. They're allowed right. to roam the country free. You wrote a paper on this. Tell us, why, why are they not in jail? Why are they allowed to roam free? Ask them. It's ridiculous. I mean, when the acting ICE director finally responded to a congressional letter and pointed out that there are 662,566 criminal aliens on the detained and non-detained docket, docket, which means either an ICE detention or not an ICE detention, and then you drill down and you realize that, you know, we're talking about on the non-detained docket, 13,099 convicted murderers, 15,811 convicted people of sexual assault, weapons offenses. I thought the Democrats were against guns. Uh, 13,423 people convicted of weapons offenses on the non-detained docket running around. And we pointed out in our piece on the Daily Signal that, you know, that means when you look at the people in detention, ICE detention, and not in ICE detention, only 2.1% of those convicted of homicide are in ICE detention. Only 3.2% of people convicted of sex assault are in ICE detention. ICE has almost 45,000 beds. There's plenty of room at the inn for the category of one convicted serious criminals. So who's making these decisions? It's not defendable. It's not defensible at all. I want to make sure that that we're cutting through with all this, Cully, and and, and part of it is because, you know, I'm not a legal expert and I'm not the smartest bulb on the tree. See, I didn't even get the analogy right. But uh, you're telling me that people are make contact with Border Patrol. Border Patrol finds out who they are as they're coming into this country illegally, finds out that they have a homicide conviction in the country they're coming from. And 98 percent of them are just led into the country to roam free. Only two percent of them have actually been detained. Of, of these convicted murderers. Yep. Yep. ICE has the option of putting them in ICE detention, and they don't. 
I wish, has you, an I wish you could see Larry right now. Ugh. I, I, I'm sorry. Uh, I, did, I, did, I, I feel like I'm in a, a bizarro world, Cully. They, and, and how, uh, we need some grown-ups back in charge, I think. I think Larry, we need to start I, I adopting did, that. <laughs> I, did, I did call you mellifluous. In my tweet that. this morning, promoing this, uh, yeah. uh, it's a good SAT word. Exactly. But look, you're a smart guy. You don't have to be. Uh, you don't have to get past sixth grade to understand this is just not defensive. This is stupid. I mean, you're right. I, I got to ca- catch this people. guy entering our country illegally. Border Patrol right. runs a trace on him. Turns out he's a convicted murderer. Go ahead. Here, here, here's the key to the city. Go wherever yep. you want. And only 2% of those individuals, and we're talking about 14,000 of them, only 2% actually get detained and, and held in, in ICE, ICE detention. detention. In, in ICE, ICE detention. When, uh, ICE, uh, yeah. when the ICE director, Julie, says in his letter that they have 41,500 ICE beds. So if you, if you added up all the numbers that he said in his letter, all the Category 1 convicted criminals these are the, the top worst of the worst there's plenty of room at the end for them yeah yeah but, so yeah. But has the administration explained why they choose to let you know most they haven't of even been asked to explain out? yeah meanwhile right. alvin bragg is busy putting daniel penny in jail okay so right and and convicting donald trump all right yeah, we gotta leave yeah, it there Cully. honestly Ugh, we right. got it's time for the gr- we got to get the grown-ups back in charge that was their to, line wasn't it i need to breathe four years breathe. ago all right, I'm going to breathe. Yeah, I'm going to yeah. get myself off the ledge. Cully Stimson, congratulations, <laughs> yeah. obviously, on the success of the book. And now the brand-new documentary available. Where's the best place for people to get it, heritage.org? Yeah, or YouTube or The Daily Signal. It's everywhere. We've done a huge ad go. buy, so it should be everywhere. Yep. Great. Fantastic. Rogue Prosecutors, Cully Stimson. Uh, always good to talk to you, my friend. Thank you, sir. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. Left you. Now. On 105.9 FM and streaming worldwide on the WMAL app. O'Connor and Company. Oh, hello. You know, it's funny what I just did. I, I uh, for regular viewers or <laughs> listeners of this program, they know that I also talk to Fox 5 every day at 730 every Wednesday. And I have two different microphones, one for television, <laughs> one for radio. And I was just opening this you segment beautifully. Away. On my television microphone, and yet here is my radio microphone. Well, they look the same. It's 737, and we're right where you want us to be. You're right where we want you to be, and that's the secret to a happy marriage, I think, Julie Gunlock, wouldn't you say? I would say so. All right. (laughs) Joining us right now, Dan Epstein. He's the vice president of America First Legal to talk about a bar complaint just filed on behalf of Stefan Passantino. Now, for those of you who uh, think, hey, that name sounds familiar, that that was Cassidy Hutchinson's attorney mm. when she was wrangling with the January 6th committee right up until the moment that after some what appears to be illicit and unethical communications between uh, former Congresswoman Liz Cheney and uh, Mr. Passantino's client, Cassidy Hutchinson, he was summarily fired by Ms. Hutchinson, and then she acquired new attorneys recommended by Liz Cheney, and suddenly her story changed. And she came up with that wild, fictional story about Donald Trump trying to drive the beast over to the Capitol. I hope I laid that out properly, Dan, because that story is stranger than fiction. And it certainly sounds like Liz Cheney may have been guilty of witness tampering. Am I reading this wrong? Uh, Larry, I think your articulation of the facts is dead on. uh, And I think that's why. Uh, just as a matter of legal ethics, which bind every licensed lawyer, including Liz Cheney, you must not communicate with a represented party that you know to be represented. And that is precisely what she did. Why does our ethics system in virtually every state in the country have this same ethics rule? Because we don't want lawyers trying to influence clients uh, to distrust the legal profession. And that's mm-hmm. exactly Uh, What happened here, Cassidy Hutchinson was manipulated into firing her lawyer into lying about him trying to uh, to coach her. Uh, And Liz Cheney uh, needs to be held accountable to send a signal uh, to other lawyers in power that you can't do this. It's simply unethical. Yeah. Yeah. And and you go ahead. Go ahead, Larry. 
Well, I was going to say, I'm, I'm curious what your client's recourse is right now. What What is your client? Your client, again, was the original attorney who, who was paid and, and was representing Cassidy Hutchinson. What Did Cassidy Hutchinson express any discontent over his ability to represent her? Was there any sort of a disagreement over the approach they should take? And what recourse does your client have with regard to Liz Cheney or this committee? You yeah, know, Larry, it's a, a great question. Uh, Mr. Passantino, uh, who has been a phenomenal lawyer throughout his career, he was specifically hired by the White House Counsel's Office in 2017 because he was widely considered not just to be one of the most ethical attorneys in the country, but to be the expert on ethics, uh, which he was. He ran ethics uh, for over two years in the White House Counsel's Office. Uh, he was the chief one that uh, virtually every ethics uh, and policy compliance entity in the executive branch trusted, as well as in Congress. And so this this is a, a you know a big dude when it comes to uh, ethics, a big dude when it comes to his reputation, and Liz Cheney uh, threatened to ruin it. Now, ultimately, uh, this doesn't give him a private right of action. It's not something he can take to court. Um, but this shows that uh, our client. Uh, Mr. Passantino is someone who takes ethics seriously. Uh, he's not trying to do this for money. He's not trying to do this to get some judgment against her. He's trying to do this to signify that ethics matters, exactly. that his reputation was besmirched, and he did the right thing. So I'm not a lawyer, and I don't know how these things work, but what is the process and sort of the timeline for these bar complaints? And ultimately, what could this lead to? Could Liz Cheney lose her license? What What's what ultimately could this could happen? Yeah, no, that's a phenomenal question. And look, you know, we, we filed a bar complaint in the D.C. bar where, you know, she's an inactive member. However, under D.C. bar rules, they have oversight even uh, over inactive members. And, uh, you know, I think ultimately these things are, are kind of close held by the bar associations in terms of how they do process. But remember, the D.C. bar has already been in a rodeo like this. They have, uh, in the January 6th context, and the lawyers who uh, had advised uh, President Trump during that time, the D.C. bar entertained a number of complaints and moved pretty quickly. And so yeah. I think viewers and listeners should be on the lookout for, is the D.C. bar going to slow roll this because it's Elizabeth Cheney, or are they going right. to take this as seriously as they took the other bar complaints? Dan Epstein, America First Legal, is with us. And uh, here's what they'll say. All right. The Pasatino worked for the Trump White House. Uh, he was uh, assigned to Cassidy Hutchinson to help with the cover up, to make sure that she didn't uh, reveal the real truth about Donald Trump's involvement in the insurrection. And she wanted to tell the truth. He was trying to advise her not to. And that's why this switch happened. What, what would your client say to that allegation? I'm guessing that's what they'll say. Yeah, my client would say quite simply, if that was all true, then I would have just walked away after I was fired and taken my check. And that is exactly what didn't happen. Um, our client, Stefan Passantino, is such a high quality, uh, high ethics person that for him, it wasn't about the money. For him, it wasn't about the fact that he was representing a client in a high profile uh, uh, January 6th Select Committee investigation. It was that his reputation was besmirched. And he looked at that and he said, you know, um, I've been the highest standard ethics lawyer uh, in my whole career. I've advised people on ethics. This seems odd. Something seems odd. And it turns out our client was absolutely right. There was something odd. Liz Cheney was texting with your client without your knowledge. And she was yeah. getting Alyssa yep. Farah Griffin to also text with your client. Yes. Yep. Well, uh, we'll see how the D.C. bar handles this and what the next steps are. I'm glad that America First Legal is on the case. You guys uh, do a great job, and we appreciate you joining us on this today. Well, thank you so much Liz, for your time. You betcha. Liz Cheney should definitely answer to this, even if she was an inactive member. Of Headlines. Analysis. Perspective. News Talk 105.9 WMAL. Making sense of the news. This has been an extraordinary presidential election cycle, no secret there. And I remind you that two weeks from right now, we could very well be talking about the next president of the United States, as it will be the day after Election Day. And there are some indications that it actually uh, won't be 
a mystery the day after. Like, I hope mm. that's the case. I hate having to wake a week. It's Me ridiculous. Too. It makes us feel like a third world nation. Uh, there have been a lot of hallmarks to this election cycle, but I think it would be, uh, I think it's it's a fair observation to say that this has been the presidential election of the podcast. Podcasts have come into their own here where you see Donald Trump and Kamala Harris to a lesser degree, just because she doesn't do any media at all, uh, really spending a lot of time with these niche sort of hyper-focused audiences that cater to people who don't, podcasts that don't always talk about politics, frankly. Right. But, he, but he's gone. He sits for an hour, sometimes longer, and just, you know, let's lose. J.D. Vance just did the um, Theo Vaughn podcast yesterday, mm. and it's a remarkable conversation, uh, And as did Trump earlier in the election season. And, but yesterday, the granddaddy of them all, the Joe Rogan show. You know, the Joe Rogan podcast is the number three podcast in America, but number one and number two are true crime podcasts. Hmm. So when you're looking at an interview podcast based on politics, pop culture, and current events and opinion, Joe Rogan is numero uno with upwards to 15 million daily downloads. And it was announced yesterday that Donald Trump will appear on the Joe Rogan podcast this Friday. And let me just say, Hmm. That 15 million daily download, that number is going to explode this Friday for that podcast. Yeah, and if, you don't, if you're not familiar with Joe Rogan, he is not a conservative. He is no. curious. He is yeah. very, he is a and deeply, deeply curious person who asks very good, he's actually a very good interviewer. He has ex- excellent questions. Um, I mean, he's no Larry O'Connor, but he's, he's, yeah. he's, at, he asks very good questions and, um, and he really, he gets um, his guests to kind of relax and yep. uh, sometimes share too much, but, um, right. but which is a danger not, for Trump and the yeah. left loves the, because he is curious and because he asks the, you know, these really sort of deep questions. Um, or he digs down into the details. You know, the left hates him. They hate. They hate him. He, he doesn't play their games, and so he's often cast as a conservative. But he really well, isn't. They used to love him until during COVID. He right. said, "Hey, why, why, what's going on here? We, why can't we talk about right. ivermectin? Why can't we talk about that? none of this right. stuff seems to work?" And then he became en- enemy number one. By the way, I've undersold his numbers: seventeen and a half million subscribers on YouTube, fourteen million followers on Spotify. Mm. Uh, it's going to explode this Friday. And by the way, the other great thing about this is if you're looking at uh, the media game in this election as a chess game, uh, Kamala Harris has just been moved into a checkmate because, you know, during it, Joe Rogan's going to say, by the way, we'd love to have Kamala Harris on. And, you know, Trump's going to say, oh, yeah, I think she should come on. I think that would be great. I think, you know, why I'm here. I, I think she'd be terrific, Joe. I think you're, you know, and <laughs> no, Kamala crazy. has two choices. Neither of the choices are good. Either either she'll be forced to acquiesce and go on Joe Rogan and she will fall apart oh, yeah. because it'll be an hour and a half, two hour long, unedited sort of freewheeling conversation, which we, we know she's incapable of. 60 Minutes couldn't even um, put 40 minutes of her interview out there, right? Or she will refuse to do it, which is also a losing proposition for her. Either way, this is a brilliant move, and I can't wait to listen to that podcast. It's 7.54.